I'm going to talk about tracks through time in Cumberland County this evening. Um, and one thing that I want to convey right from the start is when we look at a railroad and we look at the right of way, it looks pretty solid and permanent, does it not? Well, actually, the railroad tracks in Cumberland County over the last 180 years have been very fluid. They've grown, they've changed, they've contracted, and they continue to change as we speak. So we'll talk a little bit about that as I go through tonight, and we'll talk about the various railroads, and I'll, I'll get into them in a minute. Does anybody know where this picture is taken? This is Mount Rock. This is MR Tower on the Cumberland Valley Railroad. It's 28.8 miles west of Harrisburg. It's about a mile and a quarter east of Newville. That's now Rail Trail. And you can walk into that spot. The telegraph call was MR for Mount Rock. And again, it, it kind of moved around. Kind of a confusing picture. It looks like an interlocking, but it's got numbers on the signal, so it's a block signal, not an interlocking signal, but there's a tap. We'll talk a little bit about some of that. But anyway, I don't want to get maybe too engrossed in some of the detail, but um, those are some of the things that I was hoping to share tonight and to go over. As soon as I figure out how to make this move. Okay, just by quick way of introduction, I'm a fourth generation railroader. My great grandfather was killed while in, working on the railroad, on the middle division of the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1907. The family, my, grand, my great grandmother and my grandfather migrated to the Harrisburg area. They moved to Wormleysburg by 1910. My grandfather went to work as a, a, a railroader by 1912. In 1926, my grandfather bought a house at 417 Utah Street in New Cumberland. My father was born and raised there. My father worked for six months for the Philadelphia and Western, which is technically an interurban railroad, but it was built with a steam railroad charter, so I call him a railroader. And then I had the experience in 99 and 2000, I worked for Norfolk Southern as a conductor. The best day of my life was the day I left the railroad. <laughs> the second best day of my life was the day I went to work for the railroad. Okay? The picture on the left is my, Greek, my grandfather working at Harris Tower in Harrisburg in 1943. The picture on the right is me taken in 2017 at exactly the same spot in exactly the same pose as a result of the fact that the Harrisburg chapter of the National Railway Historical Society has saved Harris Tower and made it into a museum and we're able to go back and recreate those things. So it goes back a ways with me um, in terms of my interest in railroading. So tonight, I want to talk about the history of railroading, why the railroads that were built in the county were built, what propelled their being, talk about what was built and where, and then describe the status of railroad operations in the county today. Now, the start of our, our story is really in the 1820s when we start to perfect the steam engine and the flange reel, and we start to develop railroads in the United States. So it's almost 200 years of history as we stand here and talk tonight. So it, it, it goes back rather far. Anybody know where that picture is taken? Lemoyne. Well, actually, Bridgeport. Lemoyne did not exist. This is Lemoyne today. Bridgeport, we're looking down the river toward New Cumberland. The original River Road is visible there. If you ever go to New Cumberland to the baseball field and the old stone house, that's where the original road was. The Northern Central Railroad crosses on the curve track. They had a roundhouse and a station here, and the railroad in the foreground is the Cumberland Valley Railroad going to Harrisburg. What you're looking at here is today's bottleneck. Oh, gosh. Just to give you some idea of how much things have, have changed. <laughs> so in the county, there's several distinct area, errors of railroad development. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these as we go, but between 1830 and 1860, outside forces or outside investors primarily drove railroad development in Cumberland County. From 1870 to 1880, Iron ore and the iron furnaces that survived, Pine Grove and Carlisle Furnace at Boiling Springs, drove the railroad development. Then from 
1881 to about 1895, Cumberland County was at the crossroads of national battles between major railroads. People like Cornelius Vanderbilt, the New York Central, and Thomas Scott, and the Pennsylvania Railroad, and McLeod, and others in the Reading Railroad, and they fought to assemble trunk lines and build competitive railroad systems. Those competitive railroad systems very much parallel or parallel what today are the interstate highways. And they piecemealed the railroads together. Then from 1900 to about 1925, we go through a period of building out and modernizing the infrastructure. And then from 1930 to the present time, we go through decline and dismemberment and um, the, the removal of a lot of our, our rail assets in the county. This picture is Dills. Now, in this particular case, we're looking east. Trindle Springs is about where that barn is. We're looking at double track that goes east to Lemoyne. Behind the photographer would be Carlisle. It's probably very difficult for you to see. Here's a block operator, and he's got hoops in his hands meaning that a train, a westbound train, is just going through there, and he had handed up orders telling that train where it was allowed to go. Kind of a, an interesting historic picture. That track junction still exists, but the, the signals are, are long gone. So, what drove railroad development? Well, everybody in the 1820s wanted to get, in the 1830s, wanted to get to the Ohio River. Why did they want to get to the Ohio River? Because it was cheaper to send something from Pittsburgh to London via boat, via the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, and the, the, the ocean, than it was to transship something across Pennsylvania. Remember that until about the 1820s, Carlisle was almost the western edge of the American country. And it shifted a little bit west but not much west from there. And there was a vast competition from the trade and the traffic of the heartland of the United States. And the major shipping artery for our portion of the country was the Ohio River. So Pittsburgh, which was Pennsylvania-oriented, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. Who thought of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal? George, George Washington. So that goes back a bit. And the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad chartered in the 1820s, first common carrier railroad really in the United States. So, as railroads start to develop, they're trying to project the railroads so that they get to the Ohio River, and there's different strategies that will be used to do that. There's also a huge rivalry between the business interests of Baltimore and Philadelphia. <coughs> locally, not including the turnpike, but locally, the first interstate highway built in Cumberland County was built to what city? Baltimore it was Route 111, Interstate 83, was locally our first interstate. It was aimed at Baltimore. If you look in Cumberland County, there's Baltimore streets, there's Baltimore roads, there is no Philadelphia street, there's no Philadelphia road in Cumberland County. We were a Baltimore city. And we were focused in that direction. We were focused in that direction via Chambersburg and via Gettysburg. Route 30, what's now Route 30, and it was that trade rivalry. So the Philadelphia interests got together, Biddle and his bank and other people, and they chartered the Cumberland Valley Railroad, and their goal is to funnel the trade of the Cumberland Valley from Baltimore toward Philadelphia, because by that point there's a, a canal and a railroad that go to Philadelphia. Then people trying to get the anthracite coal. Baltimore needed fuel. The Susquehanna River was never navigable. A bunch of businessmen tried to build, and they built three steamboats, and tried to get them up the Susquehanna River, and when one of them blew up by Berwick, they quit, and they invested in railroads. Okay, anthracite coal. Then the trunk line rivalry, and I'll, I'll talk about these more as we go, but we end up, in the early years, in the 1880s, we're trying to build that trunk line to go to Pittsburgh. The Pennsylvania Railroad had a monopoly between Philadelphia and, and Pittsburgh, and they were blood, I mean, money-thirsty people. <laughs> and they priced according to what the market would bear. They had no competition. So a lot of interests went together to break that monopoly, and we'll talk about that. That drives a lot of things up through the 1930s. And then finally, 
we had local interests, the iron ore interests, and we'll talk about the, the iron ore branches that were built that also are affected by that. Um, so, everybody's heard of the Cumberland Valley Railroad, correct? Kind of our railroad. It's kind of interesting. Anybody know where that picture is taken? This is kind of the quiz, instead of doing it at the end. This is, uh, actually it was called Lee Moyne Transfer, but it is at White Hill. If you're familiar with what used to be Central Soya, the big feed mill, that's it. The track going off to the right crosses Gettysburg Pike at the old VFW, and to the left is the, the Cumberland Valley Railroad, um, Moyne East. Before we had UPS, the railroads did package delivery. So each station would have a box car, their LCL would go into that car, if I ship the package in Newville and it's going to Harrisburg, that box car would come here and it would take, take it off the Newville box car, put it on the Harrisburg box car, if it's coming from Harrisburg to Shippensburg, come off the Harrisburg car and they put it on the Shippensburg car, and then local trains would drop box cars or drop freight off at each station, and that's how your LCL got there, and your, your less than package service. Um, in the, the, the old days before we had motorized transportation. So the Cumberland Valley Railroad, kind of interesting, of course it's near and dear to us, it's our railroad. It was originally chartered in 1830, new technology. In 1830 they couldn't raise enough money. Now keep in mind that we had money in the United States in the 1830s, but we did not have a monetary system. <coughs> so it was very hard to get financing and very difficult to get financing. There's a lot of story there, so that, that didn't work out in 1830. They reached charter in 1835, and by 1837, they built the railroad from the, the river at Bridgeport to Chambersburg. Why Chambersburg? Because the route to Pittsburgh was Route 30, it wasn't Route 30 then, but that was the highway that went to Pittsburgh. That's why the first sleeping cars in the United States originated on the Cumberland Valley Railroad. People coming east from Pittsburgh would come in at night and get on a sleeping car, and then the following day go by train to Harrisburg once they got the bridge across the river. The Cumberland Valley Railroad was largely backed by Philadelphia investors, and again, if the goal was to get the trade and the traffic of the Cumberland Valley aiming toward Philadelphia. The interesting thing is that the Cumberland Valley Railroad had a tremendous impact on the Cumberland Valley. If you had a wagon load of wheat in Carlisle, how much value did that have when it got to Philadelphia? It had very little because of the freight cost. Once we got the railroad and we lowered the freight cost, the income of all the farmers in the valley went up appreciably. So we start to see economic development. And we don't see industrial development from the completion of the Cumberland Valley Railroad until about the 1870s. There's a lot of reasons for that. But it had a tremendous impact from the agricultural standpoint. Again, as I say, it, it ended at Chambersburg. They later bought the Franklin Railroad, which went from Chambersburg to Hagerstown. That's quite a story, but it's outside the county, so I won't go into it. And they later went down to, to Martinsburg, West Virginia. And they, they became a, a pretty sizable railroad. Now, the Cumberland Valley Railroad loses a lot of its importance in 1854 in that that was the time when the Pennsylvania Railroad opened to Pittsburgh. So prior to 1854, a lot of people traveling to Pittsburgh would come down the Cumberland Valley Railroad to Chambersburg and then go west to Pittsburgh via highway. When the Pennsylvania Railroad opens, that business drops off and the sleeping cars go away. The sleeping car, the last surviving sleeping car became a storage building at the shops in Chambersburg. They used it to store paint, so it's, it's long gone. Um, the second thing that happens in 1854, which affects our future, is that the Reading Railroad, through its Lebanon Valley branch, arrives in Harrisburg. So now freight from the Cumberland Valley could go to Harrisburg, and it could go east via either the Pennsylvania Railroad or the Reading Railroad. Now we have competition. What happened to freight rates? They dropped. Okay? As a result, by 1859, the Pennsylvania Railroad bought control of the Cumberland Valley Railroad and made sure that they had their thumb on it. And they kept their thumb on it until 1919, when the Cumberland Valley Railroad was merged out of existence, it was merged into the Pennsylvania Railroad. Okay? So it operated independently. I think um, everybody probably knows the route of the railroad. Um, 
but just see if I can point it out here. It started at, at Harrisburg, the bridge is still in, through Lee Moyne, Shirenstown, Mechanicsburg, Carlisle, Grayson, went to Newville. Now, when they were going to build the railroad originally, it was going to run down the center of the valley, it runs down the center ridge. But the people at Newville got a little upset and they politically forced the railroad to move to Newville. So it takes that little jog and then Shippensburg and, and south. A lot of it now is rail trail and it, it, it's quite worthy of the project that they've done. I've also included in the slides different books that exist. If you have any further questions, each slide in this program could be another program. So I, I have to go a little bit um, quickly. The second railroad that comes to the county is the Northern Central Railroad. Who backed the Northern Central Railroad? Any guesses? Oh, the Baltimoreans. I mean, Baltimoreans. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I used to work for a company called USF&G that was headquartered in Baltimore. And the headquarters staff was in Baltimore. We, that's I swear I got, but I'm sorry. But anyway. <laughs> now, the, they get here around 1851, and they parallel the river, OK? So they come through New Cumberland, Lee Moyne. They still cross the bottom of that. The Enoli Arch, which will come later, is, is right about there. This is Stella Avenue is, is in the foreground here. This is a tower called Great Separation. A couple of interesting things about this. Um, one, this is an interlocking tower, it controls the switches. The original Northern and Central are the high tracks. Later I'll talk about the low grade, they go off here. In 1916, a Pennsylvania Railroad police officer was shot by a vagrant in that area. If you go down to the Law Enforcement Memorial, uh, John L. Beiser, there's a, a stone for him. But the Northern and Central, oops, is kind of interesting. It arrives at Bridgeport or Lemoy. Lemoy doesn't come into existence until 1918 or 1908, but it arrives at Bridgeport in 1851, and it connects with the Cumberland Valley Railroad. So now, freight coming up the Cumberland Valley Railroad has an option. It can go east to Philadelphia, or it can go south to Baltimore. Again, positive impact on pricing and competition. It was extended to the north in 1853. It, they make a big cut, and we'll see pictures of that as we go. And it's extended north to get to the anthracite coal fields. And the first connection it makes with the anthracite coal fields is at Millersburg, there's a railroad goes up into the coal regions and brings anthracite coal down. There was also some local trade, but not much. The Northern Central had virtually no local impact. And this is kind of interesting. The Northern Central, when it came into Cumberland County and it went north, it went up to Marysville and went across the river. Do you remember the Statue of Liberty when the stone piers in the river? That was the Northern Central Bridge that came up Cumberland County to Marysville. They had a big yard at Marysville, crossed the river, and then went north. Now, the Northern Central passenger trains, when they came from Baltimore and York, they went across the river, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. They went across the river into Harrisburg and then went up the other side of the river to Rockville to get back on their railroad. There was almost no passenger service by the Northern Central in Cumberland County. There was never a railroad station in Wormleysburg. There was never a railroad station of any magnitude in West Fairview, and there was never a railroad station of any magnitude in Enola. They did run a few local commuter trains for the railroaders. After the Enola Yard was built, they were relatively short-lived, and they ran a loop train for railroaders. But most of the Northern Central story that we'll deal with is 1900 and later, and by that time, the trolleys existed, and the trolleys moved the railroaders to and from their railroad jobs. The Northern Central played a very small role here. Their only passenger station in Cumberland County, besides the one I talked about earlier in Bridgeport, we'll see a picture of later, was in New Cumberland. And only a few commuter trains stopped there. So, it, and this came under Pennsylvania Railroad control fairly early. The Northern Central operated independently until either 1911 or 1914, and then went into the Cumberland, into the Pennsylvania Railroad system. So the Northern Central is very important, but it, it kind of plays a minor role in our story. Then we get into the iron ore branches, and there's three of those. The first to the east is the Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg. That was a spike railroad. What happens is a group of people, Daniel and Peter All of Newville, were iron masters. They start to build an iron ore railroad, becomes the Harrisburg and Potomac. 
And in order to outwit them and block them, the Cumberland Valley backs the construction of the Dillsburg and the Canningsburg Railroad. They were cutthroat. Now the Harrisburg and Potomac builds this railroad. They start construction in the 1870s, but it doesn't go anywhere. It goes from Cleversburg to Bowmansdale. Not many people in the world go between those places. <laughs> but there was a lot of iron ore and some trade came off here. They couldn't get an outlet. The Cumberland Valley Railroad would not let them connect. They wanted to go to Whitehill and connect with the Cumberland Valley. The Cumberland Valley wouldn't do it. The Cumberland Valley says, all your freight has to come out to Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg. So the Cumberland Valley beat them for a while. And all the trading off the Harrisburg and Potomac went down to Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg. Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg bought a little iron ore for a while. That, went, that was all going by the 1890s for the most part. And then they had a picnic at Williams Grove and that hauled a lot of passengers. They electrified the line. Some people have said that the Dillsburg electrification was part of the Pennsylvania's railroad experiment in electrification. No. That started in 1895 in New Jersey. The Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg Railroad was electrified because by that time the Cumberland Valley Railroad had bought the local trolley company and they were building and repairing trolley companies in their shops in Chambersburg and they knew that instead of having a five-person crew on a steam locomotive train, they put a two-person crew on the trolley. That's why the Billsburg line was electrified. And anyway, that's another chapter. The other Iron Ore Railroad was the South Mountain Railroad. It was built from Carlisle through Mount Holly and it went to Pine Road. This is a, a shot of one of their passenger trains to haul iron and iron ore products. It opens in, in 1869. And just to, to make a point about that, when we talk about this time period, the first transcontinental railroad is completed in 1869, where the country is now connected by railroads. That's when we get a railroad from Carlisle to Pine Grove Furnace. <laughs> the original station of Pine Grove, or the South Mountain Railroad, is down on East Lowther Street, East Step Electric. That building goes back to early 1870. I talked about the Dillsbury and Mechanicsburg, and then the Miramar in 1871. Now, the, the, the Harrisburg and Potomac it was nicknamed the humble and poor back then. <laughs> Still exists, the Alls. The Alls ultimately beat the Cumberland Valley Railroad, but it takes a little while. They're all dead till it happens. But in any event, this is kind of the, the iron ore branches that were built up. And now we're into the 1870s. Then we get into the South Penn Railroad, or the South Pennsylvania Railroad. Anybody ever heard of that? Okay. Becomes the turnpike. So the South Penn Railroad starts at Harrisburg, about 13th and Berry Hill Street, and it was projected to come through Cumberland County. The freight line in Carlisle, where the railroad is here now in Carlisle, the South Penn Railroad came through one afternoon and they surveyed their right away through Carlisle. And the next day, the Cumberland Valley Railroad came through and surveyed the same route, and a couple weeks later laid track on it to block the South Penn. At that point, the only line through Carlisle was on High Street. There were 24 passenger trains a day at that point, plus probably a dozen or more freight trains. If you think High Street is noisy and stinky and terrible now, <laughs> I'm telling you, the road died got them beat. But in any event, the South Penn builds, and, and they, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, but they don't do any construction in Cumberland County until you get to the Newburgh, the first tunnel, the Blue Mountain Tunnel, or Kittatinny, whatever the first tunnel is. There's a Blue Mountain, there's a little bit of right away was graded there, and they started working on the tunnel. The other thing they did was build these bridge piers, which are still in the Susquehanna. The piers at one point were the whole way across the river. The Reading Railroad later came back and forced them out to, to do railroad work in Harrisburg. That's the Reading Railroad Bridge that's, that's there now today. So the South Penn is kind of an interesting story. It goes back to the 1850s that the, the idea starts. But in the 1880s, Vanderbilt, the New York Central, the Reading Railroad, Andrew Carnegie, a guy by the name of Hostetter that sold bitters, which were like patent medicines that were laced with alcohol. He was very rich. <laughs> they decide to build the South Pennsylvania Railroad to break the Pennsylvania Railroad, or the South Pennsylvania Railroad, to break the monopoly of the Pennsylvania Railroad. They spent ten and a half million dollars. They killed 22 people, including two workers who were killed near Newburgh one night. It was a rainy Sunday night. 
and they decided they needed a little firewood, and they went out and they're chopping down a tree, and one of their trees lands on the shed where the people slept and killed two of their people. <laughs> the reports do not say if alcohol was a factor. <laughs> but in any event, the work suddenly stops. J. Pierpoint Morgan comes in, J.P. Morgan comes in, he gets the New York Central President Vanderbilt and uh, Thomas Scott of the Pennsylvania Railroad, he gets them on his yacht in Hudson Bay, in the Hudson River in New York City, and says, uh, okay, you guys are captive till you come to some deal to quit this competition. And they do some underhanded stuff and pay off some legislators, and the deal stops. It later becomes, in the 1930s, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. One of the lead, lead people in the effort to get the turnpike started was a Carlisle attorney by the name of John Fowler. He was quite a legendary person, if you've never read about him, and a whole Fowler family, including his, his people that fought in the Civil War. But he does the whole legal justification, and he's one of the guarding people behind the Pennsylvania Turnpike. It was built from Carlisle to Irwin, mostly on the South Penn grade. There's a lot of places where they didn't stay on the grade, and there's, there's still grading. There's a, a lot of map books, a lot of information. There's a Mechanicsburg Cemetery, I forget the name of it, Bed Bowen would know. But when you look at the, and you trace the land ownership, one of the owners of that cemetery plot was Robert Sayer, who was president in South Penn, who later became president of Lehigh Valley. So it was for real, it was big, but it, it, it stopped. So the next one we, we get into, i get the right button, is what becomes the Reading Railroad. Is everybody okay so far? Is this confusing? <laughs> The Reading Railroad, remember the Harrisburg and Potomac that went from Bowman's Hill to Cleversburg? Well, in 1881, they get to Shippensburg. And they come in at, at uh, South Penn and Earl Streets, if anybody's familiar with that, that area. And they come to a stop. And the other railroad that I'll talk about that relates here is the Western Maryland. It was built as the Baltimore and Cumberland Valley, and it comes from the Western Maryland Railroad at Edgemont through Waynesburg to Chambersburg, up to Shippensburg, and that provided the southern connection. Now, both the Western Maryland and the Reading were in Shippensburg in 1881, but the connecting link between the two tracks was not built until 1885. The Cumberland Valley would not let the Reading cross that grade or the Harrisburg and Potomac cross the grade, so they had to elevate, then they had to build a ramp, and it's, it gets kind of complicated. And I'll talk about Shippensburg a little bit more about this in a minute. The other thing that they do, that connection is 1885. Finally, in 1890, the Reading Railroad takes control of Harrisburg and Potomac, and they incorporate the Harrisburg Terminal Railroad, which builds from Bowmansdale across the river to Harrisburg to connect with the Reading Railroad. They now have a competitive connection with the Western Maryland, and this turns the Reading Railroad into a major regional railroad. At that point in time, the Reading Railroad was primarily a coal hauling road and had a very limited future when they built what they called the cross line, which was the Lemon Valley that came from Reading to Harrisburg and then Harrisburg to Shippensburg. It gave them competitive outlets, and now the Reading, the Western Maryland, the Baltimore and Ohio could align with each other and compete against the Cumberland Valley and the Pennsylvania Railroad. And once again, we see a big drop in freight rates as the Cumberland Valley's monopoly is, is, is broken. So the Reading Railroad was, was very important. As I say, they purchased the Harrisburg and Potomac, and then they built the two pieces. They made the connection with the Western Maryland, and they started an affiliation with the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And it helped improve the Baltimore and Ohio's ability to get into New York City and made the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad more competitive. Two parts of that story are very detailed. One is the Shippensburg area, the way this track's connected. The way the tracks connect now is a modification that took place in 1922. And they put a bypass line, the, the high line, it, it's now mostly inactive. And the same way at, at Lemoyne, when they built the new Reading, they built Red, the first Reading Bridge in 1891, opened in 1891, and then they replaced it in the 1920s. And they became very important to the Reading Railroad and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and made them competitive. They had very little local impact. They employed a lot of people, but Shippensburg was unusual in that that was a town where two major railroads interchanged freight, the Western Maryland and the Reading, 
but they never developed a yard there. They never developed shops there. The crews worked out of Harrisburg, the crews worked out of Hagerstown, and they ran through. And they had agreements to do that uh, and do to this day. And Leedmoin was kind of the same way. Now, had the South Pennsylvania Railroad been built, the main shop for the South Pennsylvania Railroad would have been the Walton Farm in Lemoyne. You've ever heard of Walton Avenue in Lemoyne? Mm -hmm. That would have been a railroad town, but it, of course, wasn't. But um, I, again, the Reading was, was very important, as was the Western Maryland. And they had very little track in Cumberland County. They came into Fayette Street and a little bit down on Orange Street in Shippensburg. But they provided the southern outlet for the Reading Railroad, and their ownership changes, and that's going to, as we'll see, have a pretty big impact on the Cumberland Valley and the Reading Railroads uh, at some point in the future. The, the Western Maryland eventually becomes a connection to the Baltimore and Ohio at Cherry Run, and they later built the Connellsville, and that gave the Reading and a uh, New York via the Baltimore and Ohio connection to Pittsburgh and Chicago and turned the freight line through the valley here into a pretty major route. Okay, the other railroad is the Gettysburg and Harrisburg. The Gettysburg and Harrisburg, it's kind of an interesting story. The South Mountain Railroad, when it was built from Carlisle to Pine Grove, it went from Carlisle to Hunter's Run and then turned right and went up to Pine Grove. And that was it. In 1884, the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad was incorporated and it built from Hunter's Run to Gettysburg. It was an independent railroad. The South Mountain Railroad became in, would remain independent. Eventually, those two are become merged into the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad, as I'll show in just a minute, and the South Mountain goes away. But the Gettysburg and Harrisburg became a major connection between the Western Maryland at Gettysburg and the Cumberland Valley Railroad at Carlisle. And it became a very significant railroad um, in a number of different ways. The high point of the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad was 1913. And what happened in 1913? GAL reunion in Gettysburg. It was the 50th anniversary of Gettysburg, correct. And they largely double tracked the railroad the whole way from Carlisle, well, actually from Carlisle Junction, which is near Mount Holly, and put signals on the railroad to carry the tens of thousands of people that went to the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. It was a major, major hundreds of thousand dollar project. So the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad goes from Carlisle to Gettysburg in 1884, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Now here's a picture of what that looked like. That's the paper mills over here, that water tank is still there today. And you see that little guy there? <laughs> That's me. There it was, right? Yeah, it's an Iron Horse Ramble. George Johnson did a book, and, and he unveiled the rest of the story. But we did this program, I think, in 18, 1991. I went here in 1891. Um, <laughs> the guys at the firehouse would disagree. But um, when I did this, they did a Jim Bradley exhibit, and I, I did the opening program for that. And I came in, and I saw this picture, and I looked at it, and I thought, hmm. My mom and dad and little sister are there on our 1956 Chevy, and there's me in the picture. So I went to Jim Bradley that night, and I said, Jim, I'm sorry I got your picture. He, he laughed. Well, I come to find out the story. He wrote a little narrative about that. Basically, he says, I was all set up to take the perfect picture, and this obnoxious little urchin suddenly jumped right in the middle. <laughs> And in 1962 or 1972, he writes this little narrative and he says, I wonder where that little fellow is now. Well, here he is. <laughs> so that's my connection to the Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad. Um, now, when the Gettysburg and Harrisburg and the South Mountain Railroad merged and went under the control of the Reading Railroad, they leased the portion from Hunter's Run to Pine Road to a railroad called the Hunter's Run and Slate Belt. That railroad ran from Hunter's Run to Pine Grove, and they later extended a line over the mountain to a little place near Wentzville, a little place in Adams County, where there was a slate mine. If you go to Pine Grove, you can still find the right of way. If you're going up the Bendersville Road, there's an ATV trail takes off. That's the old extension to Wentzville. 
Now, the Hunter's Run and Slate Belt was a desperately poor railroad, never had any money, but they had an idea and they built the park. And if you, there's a, a video, Andre Weltman does a program on the park before the park, and you can watch that, and Andre talks about the park. But they're interesting. The Baldwin was a steam powered, there's a boiler here, and it, it's a trolley car that's steam powered. That came from the um, Fairmont Park uh, Centennial Celebration in 1876. They bought it used. Jay Cook, who Cook Township was named for, was a, a railroad financier. And of course, he knew the Baldwin people, and he was able to, to buy that. And they would run excursions over the mountain with that. And periodically, they ran trains from Carlisle to Pine Grove. Wouldn't it be neat to ride that from Carlisle to Pine Grove in the world? They buy a kind of unique engine. This came off the Brooklyn, Bath, and Coney Island Railroad, which was an elevated steam railroad that later electrified. And this is an excursion car they had that also came off one of the New York elevated railroads. And they operated that. You could go from the park and walk, and walk through the furnace, and it, it must have just been pretty neat. That goes broke. They, they build a brickworks and the, at Pine Grove. And the, the first Lutheran church is built out of Pine Grove brick, as an example of, of their brick. It's not a unique brick. Uh, but that's going by 1911, um, and it, it gets, um, I may talk a little bit about this, but it gets torn out from Toland to Pine Grove in the 1940s when they opened a prisoner war camp. At that point, the army came in and kind of took things over and they, they tore it all out. Okay, we're just about there. Hang with me. Everybody okay so far? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah, thanks. Now, the final piece of railroad development that we're going to talk about is the Enola Low Grade Yard, or the Enola Low Grade Line, and the Enola Yard, and really the Rockville Bridge. And around the turn of the century, late 1890s, early 1900s, there's a, the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad is a guy by the name of Alexander J. Cassatt. And Cassatt was a visionary, and he said, there's a new century coming, we need to modernize our railroad. So they upgraded the railroad, they did a lot of things, they just improved, they did the New York Terminal Project, um, the tubes under the river, a lot of things happened as a result of, of Cassatt's modernization program. The Rockville Bridge gets built, and because of the volume of passenger traffic that went from Chicago and St. Louis and points west, that all funneled through Harrisburg, to go to Philadelphia. So the main line from Philadelphia to, from Harrisburg to Philadelphia was very busy. He says, I want to take the freight service off that passenger line and I want to put it onto a low grade line that will be more efficient. So they build a low grade line from Enola to Parchburg. And they use the existing right of way of the Northern Central from Enola down to York Haven. They incorporate the York Haven and Rowena Railroad build across the river and then they go down to Holtwood and they cut across country and they build a state-of-the-art, what would today be well, they couldn't do it today, the Nimbies would get in, but at that time it cost billions, what would be billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. Bigger than the federal government could do. And they build this low-grade freight line and they switch all the traffic off. And the interesting thing is when at New Cumberland, when you look at this line, the first two tracks here are the Northern Central, the second two tracks are the low-grade. They separate at Stell or, or GS. Remember, I showed you that tower early, and they parallel each other, but don't connect until they get the plot, which is at York Haven, and then that's where the, the low grade line cuts across the river. Here's the New Cumberland station. That was really the Northern Central's only station. It's built to a standard pattern. If you go down to New Freedom today and ride the steam train down there, that station is the same pattern. So I, in the 1960s. There were 60 to 70 trains a day on this railroad. I have a, a sheet, the train director sheet, or the dispatcher sheet for that line in the 1960s, and it's just train after train after train. My grandparents, my grandmother, my grandfather was dead by this point, but my grandmother lived in New Cumberland, and I, my parents would send me there for like a week or two so they could have some peace and quiet, and I'd stay with my grandmother's, and I'd go down and watch trains all day. Train after train after train, passenger trains. I, it was just the super piece of railroad. Most of it's all one, as I'll talk about in a minute. But it's also at this point, about 1904, 1905, they start to build the Enola Railroad Yard. Now, the Northern Central had gone through there, 
And the old story about Enola and the little girl, and then, yeah, I guess that's true, Mr. Miller. Um, but they start to build the Enola yard. Initially, they called it Fairview. It was the Fairview yard. And after a little bit, they changed it to Enola. The Pennsylvania Railroad built the yard. The Pennsylvania Railroad built Enola. They had the Enola Real Estate Company, the Enola Water Company, the Enola everything. And they built the town up for the railroad yards. But again, the trolley was there, so there was very little passenger service um, in, in that area. The Enola yard rose with time. By the 1940s, it's the largest railroad yard in the world, classification yard in the world. By the 1950s, Conway's open. 1950s, the, the St. Lawrence Seaway opens. A lot of other changes result, and, and, and all loses its status. But this was the last major railroad construction project, um, for the most part, in the area at the turn of the century. So those are the players. We have the Cumberland Valley, the Northern Central, then we have the Iron Ore Railroads, the Harrisburg and Potomac, then the Reading, the Western Maryland, and then the Enola Yard was built. The Enola Yard was built under the auspices of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And that was the first time in the low grade, after the turn of the century, that the Pennsylvania Railroad actually built and, and originally owned any railroad right away in the county. Although they owned these other railroads and controlled them, that was their first. Now, the interesting thing that happens between 19, in the 1920s is the Cumberland Valley Railroad starts to double track their railroad as early as the 1860s, between the river and White Hill, and then they extend the double track to Mechanicsburg. And then from about 1870 until 1920, 21, they work to double track the rest of the Cumberland Valley Railroad from east to west. The final piece of double tracking, there was one single, one piece of single track from NS Tower, which is that normal school, the Penrode Tower at the south end of Shippenport was single track. And everything else in the Cumberland Valley was double tracked by that point. The last portions of the second track were actually built and completed by the United States Railroad Administration that nationalized the railroads during World War I because they had come to a standstill because they were incapable of operating the railroads with the volume of freight they had. Okay? That too is a recurring theme in railroad. Um, but anyway, so the, the Cumberland Valley Railroad gets double tracked from Harrisburg to Hagerstown and for a long period of time, the Western Maryland Railroad was controlled by the Gould family, which was scorned by all the other railroads. So the Baltimore and Ohio made a connection with the Cumberland Valley Railroad um, down in Virginia at a place called Cumbo, C-U-M for Cumberland Valley, B-O for B and O Railroad, south of um, Martinsburg. The, the, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, their coal going to New York City and to the northeastern United States, came to come low on the B&O, it came up the Cumberland Valley, and went into Harrisburg, and was then transferred to the Reading. So that there was a tremendous amount of freight traffic that made it necessary to double track that railroad. That lasted, it was completed in 1921, in 1927, the Baltimore and Ohio gained control of Western Maryland, and now they're in the B&O camp. The Reading was associated with the, the B&O, and all that coal traffic comes off the Cumberland Valley and now goes to the Western Maryland and the Reading. So all the double track that they finished in 1921 became more necessary by 1927. By 1927, the railroad was essentially, they left the track in until the Depression hit, but it was single track from Shippensburg to Carlisle with the exception of a passing siding at Newville. So they got about five or six years out of that extensive capital investment, very short-lived. When the transfer takes place, the Reading gets upgraded, the connection gets improved at Shippensburg, and until just recently, a lot of coal and a lot of traffic came off, now CSX, came up to Western Maryland and it got on to the, to the Reading Railroad. So that was the peak, really at, at 1921, 1922, 1923. They double finished the double track on the Cumberland Valley. 1916, they put the new bridge across the river for the Cumberland Valley. 1922, 23, they put the new bridge across the, the river for the Reading and do all the improvements in Chippensburg. That's the peak. And it's downhill after that. Now, what's interesting is that 
they put full signaling on both railroads. That would have looked somewhat similar to this. This is the signal that was used on the Cumberland Valley. It's a semaphore with color lights. Kind of interesting. Um, very innovative. They had a record week on the Reading Railroad. It was just a horrible place to work. They called it the killing field. Just, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but a lot of railroaders died. The only other major thing was in the 1930s, when the Pennsylvania Railroad electrified, they put the electric overhead and went to electric traction on their main lines. They extended that from Philadelphia to Harrisburg. They extended that across the Cumberland Valley River Bridge and into Enola, and also the low grade through New Cumberland got electric and across the river at Shocks Mill or, or Rowena. So there was some modification in the 1930s. At that point, Lee Moin Tower, J Tower, that's preserved at, at Strasburg, got a new interlocking plant. So there was some change and some improvement, but it was, it was very minimal at that point. Okay, so that kind of brings us to more the present time. What's left? Well, the Cumberland Valley is still intact, but what's left of the Cumberland Valley is intact from Lee Moyne to Carlisle. Mm -hmm. And there's a local train runs to Carlisle. If you've ever seen that, the biggest customer is um, Allen Distribution. And all those boxcars you see on the local train, anybody have any idea what's in those boxcars? Beer. beer. Corona beer. Okay. Oh, man. So there's other stuff, but it's mostly beer. And they get a couple train loads a day. Um, <laughs> anyway, where were they when I drank beer? But, okay, so the Cumberland Valley's still in. The Northern Central is still in, albeit in revised form. The railroad south of York on the Northern Central has been torn out until you get down to Timonium. And if you've ever ridden a light rail into Baltimore, you ride the old Pennsylvania Railroad right away. The rest of that is rail trail. But the Northern Central goes down crosses the river and it hits the port road and it goes down to uh, Baltimore and, and Wilmington and um, places to the south. North, it goes across the river on the Rockville Bridge and the track is, is still in place and it, it goes up through Sunbury and goes north. Yeah. So the, the Cumberland Valley's in. The old Reading Railroad, remember the old Harrisburg and Potomac and the All Brothers? Okay, well, the Cumberland Valley's torn out from Carlisle West. It's, it, it's <coughs> from Shippensburg and South. The Olds Railroad is now owned by the Norfolk Southern. It is an extremely busy railroad, maybe 28, 30 trains a day at the peak. It's very similar to the railroad that goes through East Palestine, Ohio, in terms of the freight and how important it is. And it connects the northeastern United States with the southeast and the southwest. Very busy railroad. So every time I hear a horn on that railroad, I can kind of hear Daniel Law waving, I won't say where his thumb is, at the Cumberland Valley Railroad. <laughs> I think it's, 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 it's kind of neat. Now the other part of it that's still in existence is the old Gettysburg and Harrisburg, south of Mount Holly, actually south of the upper mill, the old Eaton Dykeman Mill. It's still Norfolk Southern at that point, and south of there is the Gettysburg Railroad, as we'll talk about. So there's still some railroad action in the county. Here's what happens. 1940, the government puts in the prisoner of war camp at Pine Grove. When they did, they come in and kind of secure the area. They shut the post office. They tear the railroad out to Tolan. And there's a whole story about the, the prisoner of war camp, a lot of railroad stories related to that. But that's abandoned. The Tolan portion of the line stays in until the 1970s, and they hold clay out of the, where Tolan is now. 1972, the line from Carlisle to Carlisle Junction was destroyed by a flood. A lot of good Jim Bradley pictures of that. By 1976, all the railroads in the Northeastern United States were bankrupt. And the government was concerned that we preserved that infrastructure, so they formed the Consolidated Rail Corporation, which took all the assets of those bankrupt corporations and put billions of dollars into them and rehabbed them into a railroad that went on to become profitable, went on to become sold for a lot of money. Um, but when Conrail came in, they had to trim a lot of junk off the system to survive. One of the earliest things, not the earliest things, but one of the main things they did is they downgraded the Cumberland Valley Railroad. They now had two railroads down the valley, the Cumberland Valley that went through all the little towns, or the Reading, which had this class one main line on the south end. They put all the traffic on the Reading, severed the Cumberland Valley at Carlisle. The Reading had been two tracks. They single tracked it. 
put in a couple strategic interlockings and passing sidings, made that very efficient. The Gettysburg and Harrisburg Railroad south of Mount Holly went to the Gettysburg Railroad, which is an independent short line. They ran tourist railroads for a while. Um, the Dillsburg and Mechanicsburg was operated for a brief while with the state subsidy, and then it was torn out. There's an attempt now to make that a rail trail. An old yard was downgraded. At one point, they tore the hump yards out. Then later, Norfolk Southern put the hump yard back in. Now they tore the hump yards out again. <laughs> we can talk about that maybe in a question and answer. The northern central was torn out and, and downgraded. The low grade line was torn out. That billion dollar railroad that was so efficient and so effective. Now all the trains go down the Lebanon Valley Railroad. If you're ever in Lebanon and have to wait for a train, that's where that traffic goes instead of going on the low grade line. And part of that was the fact that they got thrown off Amtrak. There was the um, train crash at uh, Gunpowder or Bush, Maryland, where the Amtrak train hit the Conrail train, and Amtrak said, we don't want your train. So they, they changed their whole strategy. But it was a time of tearing up and abandoning. This is the Cumberland Valley Railroad being torn out um, west of Newville in the area of um, Neely Road um, in the 1880s. Very cold day, but that's now rail trail. Fortunately, that was saved. So a lot of changes. It, it went from railroads were everywhere and did everything to railroads are now much reduced. Um, the current situation, the Enola Yard is still somewhat open as are the shops there. The Cumberland Valley from Cleveland to Carlisle, the Reading Line as I talked about, and then the Gettysburg Railroad. You can see the Enola Yard, um, that's Lighting Station, there's the Gettysburg Railroad in Ohio blending. That's where the old brick plant used to be in Mount Holly, off of um, Pine Street. And uh, the Gettysburg Railroad, they still interchange freight. So there's a little bit left. A lot of traffic goes up and down. The diesel shop is still open in Enola. That employs hundreds of people. Locally, the railroad still employs probably several thousand or a couple thousand people anyway. In train service, the, the major terminals are Rutherford and Harrisburg Yard and Enola. You can work in or out of any of those places. Um, kind of an interesting story, but um, that's what we've, we've come to now. Now, just a few odds and ends, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. If anybody has any questions, we have to answer. This is kind of in our trivia category. Anybody know where the Dark Valley Railroad was? Dad, Jim Leonard's not here. He would know. The Dark Valley Railroad was a little horse-drawn tram railroad that went from the nail works along the creek at West Fairview out to the Northern Central Railroad. And if you've never been to the nail works site, it's, it's not hard to get to. It's, it's pretty interesting. Carlisle Manufacturing, which later becomes Frog and Switch, which is not where Carlisle Manufacturing was, had their own steam locomotive. From the years about 1850 to about 1890, Carlisle Manufacturing built thousands of railroad, both freight and passenger cars here in Carlisle, and actually built six trolleys, maybe seven trolleys. Um, and they had their own locomotive, a little engine called the Utility that they bought and refurbished and used around their yards, and it, it, it later transferred over to the Frog Switch property. When they built the Nola Yard, there was a very extensive narrow gauge railroad system built by the Kierball brothers that were the main contractor. In the 1920s, they upgraded the Newville Road between Carlisle and Newville, and they erected a little three foot narrow gauge railroad to haul ballast and stone and building materials. It wasn't incorporated, and it wasn't, there are some pictures of it though. So very short lived. My favorite, is the Shippensburg, Newburgh, and Western. Notice though that it says electric railway. It was a scam. Now if you buy the book The Railroads of Shippensburg, I talk about that, but a slick talking individual came in and convinced a couple Shippensburg businessmen that it'd be a good idea to build a trolley from Shippensburg to Newburgh. Population 303. <laughs> And he got a lot of money, and this picture shows up. I have no idea if that ever existed, if it's Photoshopped. It wasn't, I mean, this is a 1900s thing, so it's not Photoshopped, but totally fantasy. It never operated, but it's, it's pretty neat. Allen Distribution operates their own little switch engine. They have a crew of several guys that come out once or twice a day and switch the beer cars. They're all FRA certified 
railroad locomotive engineers and, and quite good. I, I talked to him one morning, very nice. ADM Milling in Mechanicsburg has had their own locomotive for quite a while. They operate their own locomotive. Um, the Williamsburg Steam Engine Association. Bill? <laughs> this is Bill's steam engine. Bill Medlinger is really one of the key people at that Williamsburg steam operation. That's the last operating Pennsylvania Railroad locomotive in the world. Oh. Is that William Grove? And Bill takes care of that quite well. And the Navy Depot has still some rail service there. There's some interesting cars. If you ever go by, you'll see a, a big heavy duty flat car with what looks like a huge dumbbell on it. I can't tell you what's in there because it's a top secret nuclear thing. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's what I've heard. Um, but yeah, there's still some of that stuff goes, goes in and out of the Navy Depot. So there's been a lot more railroading in the county than we might realize. Oh, and the other interesting thing is the Reading Railroad, it's a little hard to read, but this is a tugboat named Carlisle for Carlisle. Oh. One of the Reading Railroad's leading lawyers was a Wetzel, I think it was James Wetzel, one of the three generations of Carlisle lawyers. Um, and he did a lot of work for the Reading Railroad. They had tugboats named Carlisle, Gettysburg, and Harrisburg. And these tugboats were used, this is in Philadelphia, at Fort Richmond, but they hauled uh, barges of coal up and down the East Coast so they could extend the reach of the railroad. And they actually named one for Carlisle. I thought that was pretty neat. They get just some odds and ends. And then we've had railroad-related in industries. Frog switch. The frog is the junction of the two rails. And they cast those. They later, in 1913, started to do manganese. And they did all these other pieces. And they fabricated and, and, and designed stuff like this. They competed head-to-head -head with Bethlehem Steel and U.S. Steel. And they were extremely successful. Frog switch. They stayed in the railroad component business up until the 1960s, 1970s. Now they're just in the crusher business. But Carlisle Manufacturing, as I said, that started as Franklin Gardner and Sons, where the first Lutheran church is. They started to build rail cars in the 19, 1850s. Then if you go down um, in the area of where the Weiss Market is and the big green building that used to be um, the window place. Anderson. Yeah, Michael Anderson. But anyway, that big green building is down there. What, what's that? Middle Atlantic. Yeah, Middle Atlantic, nowhere. In that area was Carlisle Manufacturing, and they built rail cars. This is one of the last orders they had coal cars for the Pittsburgh and West Virginia. This shot is, this is the next to the last batch of cars that they built before they went back up in 1892. John Friedrich found this for us. The other thing that's neat, this is the only known photograph of this station that existed down at, at Gettysburg Junction, which is down where East Step Electric is. There have been a number of, of passenger stations down there. There's a book I did on them. Um, but that was a two-story building. That burned in the early 1900s, rather spectacular fire. But that's the only picture we have of that. But that's, that's what the Carlisle Manufacturing Plant looked like. It's gone. It, it burned down a couple of times, um, as most things did down there. But they were quite large. Kennedy Railroad Builders used to be in Shirens Town. They're now the Railroad Associates. They're headquartered out of Allenbury now. And Keystone Railway Equipment, part of Amstead, makes major railroad components and does rail car work still in Camp Hill. So there's, there's some other railroad-related industries. One of the more interesting ones to me is a company called Model Hobbies. And I did a book that's on file here. But this station was originally Robizonia in Berks County on the Reading Railroad, and Augustus Wald that started a hobby shop, he starts in the 1940s and comes over to Gettysburg in the 1960s, and he buys a station, he moves it to 9th Street in New Cumberland. It's still open. Mm -hmm. uh, third, fourth generation involved in it. But he had a business that he built model building kits for HO Model Railroad, and he did other scales. This is the tower that was at Carlisle Junction out near Mount Holly. And he made a model of that, and he sold it nationally. He had a, a whole business that operated out of the station. And most of that stuff is still there. He had a little die-cutting machine and a spin cat. It's all still there. It's, it's just he's been there for quite a while, but all the stuff's still there. Um, and if you're interested, you can see Doris at the station. She might still have the book. But he did a number of kits that were based on local prototypes, some railroad houses in Lemoyne, 
uh, on State Street, car dealerships, a lot of houses in the Crumlin Borough that he, he built these model kits for and then sold them nationally. And he competed with some pretty big people at that point in time. I, pretty interesting. Um, there was a guy, Harry Baker, he's still living, he's still a railroad fan, um, lives in Silver Springs now. He worked there as a high school student and helped put the kits together and do printing and stuff. And when I did the book, I got to talk to him and hear the stories. Again, quite interesting, something that we don't realize that, that existed in the county. I mean, just a couple other things to wrap up. The major train accidents, I know there's going to be some pictures in the exhibit of the more modern train wrecks, but the real good ones. <laughs> we don't have any photographs of them. What was going on around here in September 1862? Anybody remember? Antietam. Antietam, the Antietam campaign. And the Cumberland Valley Railroad for the Antietam campaign played a critical, critical role. They moved 50,000 troops down the Cumberland Valley, reserve troops, or militia, and got them into position in Hagerstown and, and the southern parts of Pennsylvania in case they were needed. Some guarded a few prisoners, and that's about it. But at the end of September, they had to bring them all back. So late one night, a train leaves Carlisle, and that train is told the track is clear to Harrisburg, so away they go. They get down to the river, middle of the night, it's foggy. Remember I mentioned that little utility engine? Well, that was a light engine that pulled cars over the bridge because the bridge was too weak to carry a full locomotive. It pulls out of a sidetrack onto the main line at Lemoy in the area of about uh, Temp Tech on State Road or about where the West Shore Plaza is, the farmer's market, in the railroad there. And the train from Carlisle runs into it and the troops were riding in boxcars, well the boxcars were wooden, and the trains had no brakes. Of course they didn't have time to apply them. So as the front of the train hits the locomotive, the back of the train keeps coming and the car is telescoped. Meaning that it just, carnage. Uh, it killed 12 and hurt 50. The Cumberland Valley Railroad was under the control of the Pennsylvania Railroad at that point in time. If you remember Thomas Scott and Andrew Carnegie and some of those guys, they were dispatchers, and they were dispatched to the railroad. The Cumberland Valley Railroad paid some small claims, very, very small claims, but was absolved of responsibility because it was kind of wartime and the Pennsylvania Railroad was one in the, the train. The guys that were killed were from Reading. Uh, they were kind of militia. Another pretty spectacular crash happened at, at North Dickinson School Road. Um, if you go up Pine Road and you turn down North Dickinson <coughs> School Road to go north, you'll go under the existing railroad. A short distance north of there, if you are attentive, you'll see an old railroad right of way. There was a big curve there before the curve was straightened. The train is heading west. <coughs> And the train is the pay train, so it's, it's got a carload of money and they go along the railroad and they pay all the employees. And Trainmaster Sarvis is running the locomotive. And what he had to do was he had to get to Huntsdale by a certain time to clear another train coming east. And he looks at his watch and he says, oh, it's 2 o'clock, we're in good shape. And he takes off. What he didn't realize was his watch had stopped. <laughs> So in that curve, and the track's been since removed, two trains hit head on. Sarvis lived, but five members of the pay car, or the pay train crew died in that crash. So that was our second deadliest. The picture on the left there is Britain's Wood. Only one person died in that, but that's our most photographed 1880s era train wreck. 1905, when they're building the low grade railroad, if you're familiar with 83, where that goes over the river, if you ever notice where the sewer plant is, well, that was Spong's quarry at that point in time, and they were blasting rock in that area to create the right-of-way for the low-grade line, and they had a premature detonation of some black powder, and it killed eight railroad or eight workers, some of which went a significant distance into the Susquehanna River, some of which went in a number of different directions, all from the same originating party. It was, it was pretty bad. They were mostly foreigners, and it was kind of not a big event legally. There was no, no liability. Now, the other thing that I put here is Brantsville. And this is April 1963. What are we looking at there? Propane. Propane. Chlorine. Well, the chlorine, what happens is there's a train 
going on the Reading Railroad, gets an overheated bearing. Remember East Palestine? Yeah. Same thing. Different technology, but same thing. Train wrecks. Cars go into the creek and all over the place. One of the cars was an empty gasoline tanker. A couple cars were chlorine tankers. A couple cars had propane. The chlorine starts to leak. The fire department comes in. God bless them. I'm one of them. No training. Chlorine's heavier than air. So they walk down to the creek to see what's going on. And about 15 of them get overcome by chlorine. No clue. Just boom. They're down. It's burning. And the firemen are putting water on it. And they're doing a good job. They're doing exactly what they're supposed to do. There's a state trooper there had been to a similar fire somewhere in northeastern Pennsylvania. And he says, that's going to blow up. You better shut the water down and get out of here. So they shut the water down and started to get out. And guess what happened? It blew up. Not once, but twice. They captured that picture. When you look, some of those fragments went a quarter of a mile. And it was spectacular. Nobody died here. Nobody learned anything here. The next, <laughs> seriously, there's a book recently came out called Walk Through Fire, and it talks about Kingman, Arizona, in 1978, where 15 firemen died, in exactly this situation. Because we didn't learn anything. It's kind of what was expected. But you talk to the guys, and most of them are dead. There's still a few around. Guys had coats on. Now, back then, the coats were canvas. That fireball was so intense that it burned the coats right off their backs. The worst injury we had was somebody dove under a vehicle to get safe, and the vehicle drove off at the same time. But <laughs> they, they were pretty shook up. But anyway, some of our more spectacular accidents. I didn't put it in. In the 1920s, there was a trolley crash, a trolley loaded students about where the uh, Somerdale Plaza is. And they got in a wreck, and there were 22 people, and there were people trapped in the trolley. And that's before we had ambulances and fire departments and rescue trucks, and they used pry bars, and they hauled them away to the hospital and cars. But anyway, some of the, the, the more significant wrecks. The other thing that we can credit the Cumberland Valley Railroad with is the destruction of Shirenstown in 1908. <laughs> Train going through Shirenstown, a spark comes out, sets a warehouse next to the railroad on fire, until it's done, it's burned the whole way from the railroad to Main Street. It jumps Main Street and gets into the church and goes about a quarter of a block east on Main Street. Huh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. One of the, it, this is probably until the Lear fire, or I should say the Carlisle Productions controlled burn, was our biggest fire in the county. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it was. I mean, they were tearing the building down. And they caught fire and they didn't have to pay to haul it away. It was uh, a pretty good deal for them. But anyway, this was a, a disastrous fire. Keep in mind that there were no fire hydrants in Charmanstown at this point. There were no fire companies. The fire companies that came and they hand pulled their apparatus came from Mechanicsburg and Charmanstown and Harrisburg. And Harrisburg had horses in 1908. So that's kind of a legacy to the Cumberland Valley Railroad in Sherman's now. And they have big celebrations periodically because it's the biggest thing ever happened in Sherman's now. <laughs> in any event, there's another side to the legacy of railroading too. And I talked about when I did the program back in 1990 that there's really nothing romantic about railroading and then I did an hour program on the romance of railroading. Now, to the average rail fan or to the average person, when do you see a train go by? You're up, it's the middle of the day, and the sun's out, right? Well, when you work on the railroad, you generally work when it's dark, when it's either very warm, very cold, raining, or snowing. Occasionally, you'll get a nice, warm daylight shift, or not too warm or not too cold daylight shift. It's a pretty dangerous job. When I went to interview for the railroad, they closed the doors and started the interview, and they said, we're going to talk to you about the railroad. And we're going to tell you some things about the railroad, and you have the option to get up and leave when you want. And they start out, they said, if you've ever been convicted of a crime or stole anything, leave. A couple people got up. If you ever got busted for drugs, get out and leave. If you ever had a DUI, get up and leave. People leave. Okay, now, here's the kicker. If you come to work for us, you are going to observe at least one person die in your career. It may be you, it may be a friend, it may be a civilian, but you will see someone die. 
If you're not prepared for that, get up and leave. And this was a group of about 100 people, about 20 walked out. I thought, well, that's pretty harsh. Well, I didn't see anybody die. We came within that much of getting a little kid on a bicycle, and I, where's Laura? Should I tell a dog story? Yeah. Okay, I'll finish up with, no, nah, I better not finish up with a dog story. But anyway, um, I worked one week in my training with a guy in NOLA called Raymond Zook. Jim, do you remember Ray Zook? Was he around when you worked for the railroad? Anybody know Ray Zook? Ray was about a year from retirement. He was a character, to say the least. Now, I had just spent two weeks at train, actually four weeks in, in, in Atlanta, being trained how to work safely and not get killed on the railroad. And after that training, they sent us out to work in the field with senior railroaders. So I'm following every safety rule. I'm doing everything perfect. And we get to our first break about 10 o'clock that morning. And one of the old guys comes over. He puts his arm around my shoulder. He said, look, if you're going to follow all your safety rules, you're going to kill us. <laughs> I get it. So they spent the next four weeks teaching me how to work once safely without getting caught. Because if you get caught, you get fired. So the secret is, you don't want to get hurt because you get fired, and you don't want to get caught because you get fired. But if you follow the rules, it takes a lot longer to get the job done, okay? So I followed their rules, or I, you know, I, I, I blended in with them. And any time we saw management, they'd come to me and they'd say, what should we do? And then I'd review the safety rules, and we, we came to a truth. <laughs> Well, Ray was one of those people, and I had a couple of harrowing experiences with Mr. Zook. About two months after I left the railroad, Ray forgot to look before he crossed the track. There was snow on the ground, it was quiet, it was being pushed a mile away. He didn't see it, it got him. Dead. While I was there, a car in the car shops was up on jacks, it fell off, it crushed the guy to death. I was working with the Conway Yard near Pittsburgh. We were coming back one night, as soon as we got into the yard office, the talk was one of the locomotive engineers had got out to check something on his engine, had got clipped, and he had been killed. So in that short period of time, three railroaders that I knew died. That's how deadly the railroad is. And when I talk about hundreds of railroaders, hundreds of railroaders had died. When I went to work for the railroad my first day in Nola Yard, there's an old guy there, Terry Saltzberger. We had a little break in the action, and we're leaning against the flat floor, and he's telling stories. He ran with the West Fairview Fire Department, and the, the legend, and it's every railroad town, a guy gets between the cars and gets coupled, and then they go get the family, because when they take the that's the end of it. And he had lots of other stories, and they passed those down. I worked with crews that had hit carloads of kids, and I worked with car crews that had, had guys slip, and it, the stories. It's a deadly, 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 deadly place to be. If you're within six feet of the center line of the track, we call it the six foot. That six foot spot from the center foot on both sides will put you six feet under. <coughs> you see people trespass on the railroad, you see people standing on the railroad taking pictures, they are stupid because it's a deadly environment. Hundreds and hundreds of railroaders have died in this county. Hundreds and thousands probably have been injured and scores of civilians have died. So it's, it's, it's very deadly. That's kind of the, the other side of the railroad that we, we don't realize is the cost that it has on the people and, and their safety. Even though we try and make it safe, you hear a lot of stories, it's a very deadly place. But in any event, that's kind of the story of, of the railroads in Cumberland County, where they were built, when they were built, why they were built, when they came out, sort of what impacts they had. There's a lot more, again, each slide could be a program and, and some of the backstories, the accidents, the people, um, the, the things that go on. Um, thanks.